Right, so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world, yes. Um, lovely to be with you all today. And it makes a change for me to be speaking and guiding continually with temper, venerable temper, because normally I have to wait while he translates into Russian. <laughs> so I must remember not to wait. <laughs> Okay, so this evening we're exploring the use of guided imagery. And if you are somebody who dreams vividly, then you will be in your element. Yeah. And also if you are somebody who um, spends their time thinking and imagining and being creative, then this may not be so difficult for you. But I'm always aware that some people find using visualization methods incredibly difficult. So I want to assure you from the very beginning that when we utilize guided imagery, it doesn't necessarily appear to us as a picture. It may actually occur as an idea or a feeling. So if you are someone who struggles to use imagery, don't let that block your experience. Just allow your ideas, allow your feelings to uh, arise. If you've done anything like this before, then you kind of know what I'm talking about. But if you haven't, don't worry. I'm going to take you really by the hand through this process. So first of all, just to give you the structure for the evening, first of all, I'm going to do a mindfulness meditation just to get us into our spaces, calm our minds down. And then I'm going to introduce a very um, common a method of guided visualization using light and dark, which are always universal symbols for good and bad and it, it's used widely so that's just to open us up to the use of visualization and then i'm going to talk to you a little bit about what guided imagery is and how it's used so that you get a, a kind of um a, some trust some faith in the process yeah and then we'll do the actual guided uh, visualization, which takes the form of what we commonly call the quest. And when I say we, it's kind of uh, used by writers, by storytellers, um, by um, psychologists and psychotherapists as a way of bringing to the surface things which might be going on for you and concepts which will then guide you and help you. So the whole point of this is to help you discover yourself, what's going on down there, which if we are dreamers, we know can be tricky because when we dream, by the time we wake up, a lot of it's gone. It's difficult to hang on to. It's ephemeral, it passes very quickly. And then we get up, we have our tea, our coffee, our breakfast, and we're off, and then it's gone. And sometimes something will arise, and you think, oh, that's what I dreamt last night. And how used to get used to understanding how to use symbolism. So the symbolism, as I've said, is universal, but it can also be personal. So the use of light and dark, um, they're universal symbols, but the source, which I will introduce, that's personal. What you see the source as is personal. And in the same way, you know, if for instance, you dream of being given a glass of wine, well, that can be celebration, that can be bonding, or for you, it might be temptation and a threat, a disintegration of your psyche. So that's when it's personal. So we get used to the universal and we get used to what's personal to us. And I will give you clues and ways of understanding the imagery that arises for you. So once we've done that, we'll go through it and it would be great 
if anybody, you know, rises to the surface and says, oh, you can, you know, this is what happened for me. Yeah. So as much as you put in, the more discussion and clarification of the imagery we can find. Um, and then hopefully we'll have time to utilize perhaps something from that visualization in a final meditation. So that's kind of the broad structure so you know what's going on. I always say I won't talk for long, but I always do talk too long. So I'll do my best <laughs> to be succinct. <laughs> okay, so, so let's start with uh, a nice calming meditation. As I said, mindfulness and bringing in um, some of uh, the use of imagery to just open our minds to what it can do. Okay, so just relax where you are. We're only going to spend about 10 minutes doing this. Take some lovely deep breaths. I'm sure I've got a room full of meditators, so I don't need to guide too much. You're relaxing your body. You're finding your rhythm. And you're fully entering your space, whatever room, place you're in, feel comfortable, safe. And as we start to breathe naturally through our nostrils, if possible, when we breathe out, we let go of tension. So our body starts to find a natural posture. So we're becoming aware now of internal chatter, busyness from the day. Whatever time of day it is, we'll have been busy doing something. Or we'll have some worries or plans, anxieties, just let them, let them go. And based on my introduction, you can think of your motivation. Why have you joined this webinar? Follow the breath. And focus on that sensation of breath entering the nostrils and leaving. And just ahead of you, floating in space, level with your eyes, comfortable distance of a couple of meters, 
is the most beautiful source of translucent light. So pure, emanating peace and love. Just sit in its presence. and give it shape, outline, depending on your creative imagination. Perhaps it is a spiritual source, a symbol of goodness in the world, in the universe. Let it take shape. It's so incredibly beautiful. You feel humbled before it and want to partake of this essence. And as this wish arises within you, when you breathe in, you breathe in light. The light flows towards you, up each nostril, into your head cavity, and down, right into the soles of your feet, and starts to fill you and glow. And as you breathe out, all your tensions, your stresses, your worries, your problems, anything that is upsetting you or niggling you, just leaves in the form of dark smoke out of your nostrils, disappearing into the depths of the earth to harm no one and nothing. So allow this to flow. The source of light does not diminish. It's infinite. Eternal. And as you start to fill your body with this light, wherever it touches, you relax so totally. And you too feel pure and filled with goodness. And all the scum that clings to you inside, the naughty physical aspects of pain and sorrow. Just are washed away and out. You're like an empty milk jug being filled with the milk of a great mother, nurturing and nourishing you from within. filling you up 
and right into your torso now. The smoke's being forced up, is flooding out. As you allow this light to enter you, soak you. right up to your neck. As you breathe out now, there's just wisps of smoke. The source of light is there, still giving, and you're receiving. And gradually, totally filled and all the smoke goes so you're breathing in light and breathing out light purified full of love There's so much light in you, it's coming out of the pores of your skin. There's just you, full of light and the source. And in a final act, Great giving, the source of light floats to the top of your head. And rains down on you this incredible gift of light. So finally, let that light come through your crown chakra down to your heart chakra, the center of your chest, and become one with you, one with your mind. and feel that intensity, that refuge you have in love, compassion, wisdom, all the most noble qualities any being could aspire to. and dissolve the visualization gradually from the pores of your skin inward to your heart and then dissolve that too. Let your awareness blend with the space again that you're in, your room, your chair, relax and bring your meditation to an end.
so this webinar. Exploring our vision of the path, which is about our path now. So let's get that clear. It's a long path to enlightenment, yes? So where are we now? Well, we have, we have our practices, which are um, hopefully on a daily basis, which guide us in our life and the incredible psychology that's available to us now. And especially I'm thinking with the roots of Buddhist psychology, because that's my background. Um, but we also have to deal with daily issues, even if we are a monk or a nun. But especially here, as many of us are, most of us are lay people. There are so many things that we have to deal with and our minds become so busy. So being able to occasionally, rather than letting, using mindfulness to let ideas go, and thoughts to actually use imagery which perhaps we might feel more of a relationship with enables us to explore what's going on with us right now. So this kind of um, imagery I found particularly useful for people who are looking for an answer to something. They've got a particular issue right now. They don't know which direction to go in. So because this particular guided imagery uh, practice is in the nature of a journey, it takes us subconsciously from where we are now to where we want to go, okay? So to give you some background of how uh, guided imagery has been used and um, to, to really value its importance by psychologists and psychotherapists and the world of medicine, as, as well as people like ourselves who are using it in meditation for personal um, aspirations, uh, wanted to um, relay certain particular people who have uh, been key to understanding imagery. So of course, we start with people like Freud and later Jung. Now, Freud called dreams. He worked with dreams, the royal road to the unconscious. If we can learn to understand our dreams, then we can understand ourselves. So his, his patients were asked to record their dreams, and then he was able to understand them. And Jung later uh, called his version of using imagery in his sessions active imagination. Now, commonly, um, psychologists and psychotherapists and anybody in the world of medicine, actually, doctors as well, they will use imagery perhaps to calm somebody down. You know, think of a, your safe place. Think of a beautiful um, island that you've visited and you're walking on the beach just to calm people down so that their blood pressure comes down. Yeah. So they're able to receive some kind of treatment. So it, it's, it's very common practice now. We communicate with ourselves by using the universal and personal language of symbols. Our deepest dreams, our deepest desires, they play out in what I like to call the theater of the mind. It's a stage full of actors and objects that seem chaotic. But when we understand and manage them, we can use them to make sense of our inner quest for meaning, because that's what everybody's looking for, meaning. What's going on with me right now? You know, why can't I focus? Why do I feel unhappy? Why is there always a sense of frustration? All these questions that we struggle with and we talk to our friends about, or we meditate, but still it eludes us. So I think you'll find this a very useful addition to your techniques. Um, so going back to dreams, they have to be remembered to be interpreted. 
So when we use imagery, what we do is we go into an incredibly relaxed state of mind using something like the body scan, uh, state of body, using the body, uh, using the body scan. And then we are awake. But it, it is almost like it, you're not hypnotized. You're, you're not being told what to do. There is a question like, where are you now? And I'm not expecting you all to answer, but you will see where you are. It will evolve. It will come out of your experience. So that, that's the beauty of guided imagery because you, it is as if you're being mindful of your subconscious. So there you are observing images arising. So by the end of it, you're able to record them, which is why we go into this process of writing and drawing so that you can then come to, you can then start to see, well, what does that mean? Why was that person there? What does that obstacle mean? So that, and then we are able to utilize those images. So if we feel fearful and we found a helper in, in, in our um, guided um, journey, we can then visualize that helper. Of course, we're not visualizing them. They're an aspect of ourselves. So as with dreams, everything we visualize is an aspect of ourselves, And that's the key to understanding using imagery. So this internal theater, using the same metaphor, mindfulness meditation, just to clarify, is helping us to empty the stage as far as we can so we can experience its spaciousness. So the body scan takes us through being very mindful, letting go of all our worries, letting go of the tensions in our body until we're in that lovely calm state. Then the imagery comes in and we purposely fill it character by character, object by object, so we can understand more clearly the meaning of the play. The play is ourself, ourself taking that journey. So we're utilizing our conscious mind. We become the director rather than the players. Yeah. We're directing it. So there is an element of control. It's not unconscious. There is an element of control. So I know that creative visualization techniques are used to fast track self-knowledge and healing. Yeah? I've used it before. We can talk about some of these experiences later. But first of all, I think you've had enough of the explanation and you're probably very hungry to do this now. So that's what we're going to do. It will take 10 minutes or so, 20, 15 minutes to do a really lovely deep body scan. We're then going to spend maybe 10 to 15 minutes where I take you on this guided journey. When you complete it, I would like you then to spend the time maybe drawing or writing anything that arises, anything that arises from that. And then we'll enter discussion later. Okay, so get ready. Okay, so if you can, it's wonderful to do this in supine position, just lie down. Of course, I'm always conscious that when I do this, some people get so relaxed, they fall asleep. So it depends what time of day it is for you, and you know your state of mind. What we don't want is you drifting off into sleep, the body scan and missing the whole experience. So maybe you need to, at some point, just let in a little light into your eyes, not gazing at anything in particular, just uh, unfocused light. So take care with that. If you're sitting up, you really need to be as relaxed as possible. Okay.
So as before, just start with the breath. Let's take lovely deep breaths together. Breathe in, swell the stomach, and hold the breath. Blow out softly through the lips, allowing the stomach to distend, taking it right back to the backbone before you, another, you take another deep breath in and hold. And release, and as you release, let the tensions go, the gross tensions, shoulders, jaw, just let them go. Empty, and breathe in again, and hold it. and release. And then resume natural breathing, checking your posture, your shoulders down, your necks supporting your head so that the neck straight and the chin slightly dipped. If you're lying down, you can put your hands behind your back and push your bottom down so you have the full length of the spine and take them out again. Uncrossed ankles, hands by your side, not on your belly, just comfortable. And hopefully your temperature is comfortable, not too warm, but not cold. And you're just breathing. And we're going to start with the feet. First of all, the surrounds of the feet, perhaps where the heels are touching the floor, air circulating. Going beneath the skin. Becoming aware of the sensations on the skin, just of your feet. Where the toes touch, where there's space. Awareness of the skeletal structure in your feet. Awareness of blood and flesh. You're not seeing it, you're aware of it. Any tension you find in the feet, release it. If you like, as smoke through the soles of the feet down into the depths of the earth. And come up through the ankles into the calves of the legs. What is touching them? Just the feel, perhaps clothing, perhaps blanket. Skin. Hard edge of bone, mass of flesh and muscle, 
And again, awareness of the beating of the heart, blood being pumped through your veins. Release those muscles, release. And let the tension flood downward through the ankles and out through the soles of the feet, down into the earth. And come into the knees. If they're bent, they'll feel stretched at the front. And fold it the back. Skin, those complex sensations of the joint, the knee joint cartilage and tissue to the depths of your knees, releasing, releasing any pain, discomfort. Don't give anything labels, but just release, let go down and out. And into the thighs. Same process from external to internal without judgment, without labeling nice or bad, painful or pleasant just aware of the sensations. And as you become aware, releasing most subtle tensions. Your breath like sighs of relief as you breathe in and out naturally. Allowing the tensions in your thighs down, traveling down and out. Into the buttocks and the pelvic region and the groin. Awareness of bone, muscle, flesh. Awareness of warmth and folds. Awareness of breath falling arising in the tummy. And with the awareness, releasing. Releasing. Down and out. Up the spine, vertebrae by vertebrae, spanning out across the back. Your awareness making a journey from the base of the spine up. And across the shoulders, the shoulder blades. We hold a lot of tension in the back. So take your breath in and send it there to unknot the knots. 
and then breathe out the tension in the upper part of your body. And you can feel as you breathe your rib cage expanding, allowing deeper breaths, more luxurious breaths. And release as you breathe out. And come into the shoulders themselves. Again, sources of intense tension as we carry the world and our emotional baggage round with us. Let it go. Put it down. Feel the tension being released down through your arms and out through your fingertips. Bone, muscle, flesh, space within, all the time from exterior to interior. Following the shoulder joints down into the elbow joints and then the wrists. Feeling where your arms are close to your body and where there's space. Outward to inward and into the hands complex nerve endings in your fingertips. Soften them, loosen the hands and let all that tension that started in your shoulders be released out through the fingertips, gone. Lovely deep breaths as you go into your tummy now and become aware of your waistband, of the breathing in and out, of the depths of your stomach, the presence of your organs. The rib cage, your heart beating everything just doing its job. Now your breath becomes more and more relaxed. Breathe out that tension. Come into your neck and throat softening, melting, breathe it out and into your head, glancing through the skull and resting on your face, the feel of air on your face. the presence of hair, the dry places, the moist places, and the orifices, the bulges that make your incredible, unique face. And inward to behind the eyeballs, into your mouth. Softening the eyes in their sockets and the cheekbones and breathing out, letting go of the last vestige, tension and stress in your body. So now you're just breathing and totally relaxed.
and visualize yourself. Let the images arise. Don't push them, provoke them, just see what comes. And even if you think these images are uncomfortable, let them come. See yourself in the most beautiful garden. It's a sensory delight. What time of day is it? What is the weather like? What can you see in your garden? Grass, trees, shrubs, flowers, water, seats, let it build. Walk around your beautiful garden. Enjoy it. Smell the air, the grass, the flowers. Hear the sounds of the garden. You feel so safe here. and happy. Perhaps there are fruits where you chew on a blade of grass, you can taste your garden. All your senses are engaged. And then you look out beyond the garden and in the distance, you can see a mountain and you are transfixed. You want to climb that mountain. It's calling you. And so you leave it. How do you leave it? And what landscape are you walking through? You're walking a path. And up ahead, there's something in the path, some kind of obstacle. What is it? And you're determined to get to the mountain. So you're going to overcome that obstacle somehow. How do you do it? And there you are, back on the path. You've done it. The landscape is changing now. The mountain's getting nearer. And you notice along to the side of you, there's something going on, something interesting. Maybe it's people or a village or a fate or a fair or something that you want to be involved with. So you're taken there by your desires. Who or what is going on and how do you engage?
And then you remember your mountain. You have to leave. Is it easy to leave or difficult? Does anyone or anything try to stop you before you disengage and return to the path? And you're on it again, and the mountain's getting nearer. In fact, you're getting close to the base of the mountain, the foot of the mountain. Look at the landscape. How do you feel as you look up? And then just at the foot of the mountain, someone appears to help you. Who is it? How do they help you? You're going to ascend alone, so you have to leave them. And you start your walk up the mountain. At first you can walk. What kind of base is it? Is it scrubland? Is it gorse? Is it rough rock? Are there streams? What's the temperature like now? And you're walking upward and gradually it becomes more demanding and your breathing is affected. To keep going, you can see the top of the mountain. Just up there. Maybe you stop for breathers and to look back. Or to continue to look upward, but just breathing. Maybe something that was given to you has helped is useful and you continue to climb and now you have to use your hands occasionally to grasp onto rocks and to haul yourself up but you're getting close there is a ledge if you can just reach up and get hold of the top of the ledge and just as you do someone reaches down to give you a hand and helps pull you to the top of the mountain. And you are so happy to see them. Who are they? What are they wearing? There is a lot of love and happiness there between you both. And then the being or the person gives you a gift and you hold it in your hands and you know that this gift is going to help you, help you in your life, help you now. What is it? Let it emerge in your hands, the weight of it, the color, shape, the value. Again, you're incredibly happy to receive it. And you have some interaction together at the top of the mountain.
And then you know you have to return. You have to depart. So you say your farewells. You look back towards your garden, which now is calling you back. And you go, you make your way down the mountain. And here we dissolve all the imagery into your heart. And very, very gradually, slowly, giving yourself time to come around, uncurl. You end the meditation. And whenever you are ready, and I suggest you have a drink of water as well, please do draw anything that was vivid, particularly the gift, and write down anything that comes to your mind that was important. And so we'll all sit together until about 10 past seven, gives us seven minutes to record our experience.
in just a couple of minutes now. Okay, so you can uh, still continue scribbling away if you want. I'm just going to outline the symbolism within that. So as I mentioned before in the introduction, this is known as a quest. So you start from this wonderful safe place, your refuge, your haven, and you go out mentally and emotionally on this, on this journey uh, to discover an answer or something that can help you. So um, you can see this actually in uh, the stories of religious figures. In this, you are the hero or heroine, but if you think of any of the great spiritual teachers like Jesus or Muhammad or the Buddha, you can see that they themselves start in a place and they meet obstacles, they meet distractions, there are helpers, and there is um, a higher self or some being or someone or that they actualize within themselves. Yeah. If you think of these stories, Lord of the, it's also fictionalized, it's often used in stories, Lord of the Rings being. Um, an obvious one. So you are, in this, you are the hero or heroine. Yeah. And you are on your quest. And your quest can be one, as I said before, for now or for a future self. But we're constantly rebirthing ourselves, aren't we? E each little time, each time we have in life. And then there's another step along the way. So this is really useful for those particular steps. So the journey is life, yeah? So where is life taking you now? And the, the obstacle that I mentioned in your path is something that is blocking you. Now that obstacle could be people, could be even loved ones. I did this with, I started doing this as a school teacher terrible you know using my poor students as guinea pigs they loved it they loved it and one one child in particular was uh, amazed because when they did this they found that actually the obstacle was their parents who were not encouraging him to carry on his studies and wanted him to leave school and he was really shocked because he knows his par he loves his parents and his parents love him but they were standing in his way so, which did not mean that he was then going to divorce his parents, but it was just an inner realization that he had to, he had to deal 
with that situation in his life. So it, it could be an emotion. Maybe we are hanging on to guilt or fear, or we have um, some jealousy going on from an experience in our life, whatever it is, is an obstacle to our development because we are attaching ourselves to that emotion and it's standing in our way from freeing ourselves to move forward. So that's always interesting to understand the symbolism of that obstacle. Uh, if it's water, for instance, is it turbulent water? Is it calm water? Do you, do you nearly drown getting across? Or do you just trip over it? You know, how, how easy is it to deal with? Um, water, you know, being um, a symbol for emotions, for troubled emotions, if it's very turbulent. Okay, so that's just one example. And then I had that little thing going on, you know, was that a pleasant thing? Uh, was it a distraction rather than anything unpleasant? What was it? You know, I mentioned before being offered a glass of wine, you know, that, that, and, and that being something that could be lovely, you know, celebration, have a drink with me, you know, or it could be something that symbolizes um, a major distraction in the form of alcohol and drugs, or maybe not alcohol at all, but something uh, to do with being held back by people, a, a peer, peer group pressure, it's people who are pulling you into their way of life, yeah? So it could be something like that. Uh, are there opposing forces, distractions. Now, when you get to the bottom of the mountain, you meet a helper, and that's always lovely. And often, often it will be somebody that you know. You know, it might be your mom, your dad, they might have passed on. But what you want to do when you think of that person, and this is a good, ex this is a good way of understanding all symbolism, is if whoever that person is, it's not them that you're visualizing. They're an aspect of yourself. So if you think of, you know, if you think of your mum, well, she, just say the first three or four words until you get that sensation in your body of, ah, that's what it means. Oh, well, she was very strong. She was very stubborn, but she'd do anything to help me. She really loved me. And she, and she shared my a uh, sense of um, adventure. Yeah? Just say those words until it hits you. That's what she represents to you. Yeah, that's a way of understanding symbolism. It's not. It's really not difficult once you get the hang of it. So there's your helper, and then you go up the mountain. Well, mountains are always symbolic of going to a higher place, and you go to the higher place to meet your higher self. So you will be aware um, if you've studied any religion, particularly Buddhism, that we're constantly talking about battling with the ego and, and finding our higher self or our Buddha nature. Yeah. So there you go. There's your higher self. Epitomizes your journey towards actualizing yourself. This is who you wish to become. It's your potential. This person or being is your potential. And in any situation where you need guidance or advice, if you visualize this being or person and ask the question, you will receive an answer that is more reliable from other people or from your ego chatter. You just visualize them. Yeah. I know Christians have this thing around their wrist, don't they? What would Jesus do? Yeah. They carry it around with them. Some, some of them, uh, I've heard about this. And, and it's a bit like that. Well, you know, what should I do? Don't ask your mates. They're as screwed up as you are. Ask your higher self. <laughs> okay. Ask your higher self. They're much more reliable. Um, you know you better than anybody else. You've just got to unearth that higher self. 
okay? And then you get the treasure, you get the rings. <laughs> or, or Muhammad got the angel Gabriel and received the Quran, yeah? The Buddha became enlightened. You get the gift. So what, what does the gift, that, that gift is really important to you now. And I've, you know, I've heard about all kinds of gifts. I've done this so many times and it's just really lovely that, you know, lots of children meet Gandalf at the top of the mountain. They literally do, you know, with the big hood and everything and this fantastic kind of wise being, which is lovely. Uh, I had one girl and she was very troubled and she was behaving badly. And she met her dead grandmother at the top of the mountain. And when, when I asked her about the qualities of her dead grandmother, she said, she loved me for who I am. Yeah. Isn't that moving? And it really helped her. And so we talked about it and her teachers understood the use of it. These are enlightened teachers. They don't always let you into the school to do this kind of thing, but uh, how effective. And it really helped her. So she was able to, instead of dismissing or having to forget because your grandma's dead, it was, she's still alive in you. She's your role model. She's your potential. Let her guide you. And you didn't have to say to her, it's your higher self, you know. To say, well, it's your grandma, yeah? But it was a higher self, is what she wanted to be. And she wanted to be accepted and loved. So I've had some, uh, I've, I've also had people, um, one woman whose husband died of cancer very, very quickly. And she was unable to say anything to him. And she used to wake up from nightmares quite regularly where she couldn't get to him. She just couldn't get to him. So she did this. And of course, she met him at the top of the mountain. And then she was able to say what she wanted and say goodbye. And she stopped having nightmares. It's very, it can be very powerful, very powerful. Yeah, I could tell you some stories. That's just a few. But, uh, and it's not always powerful. It's not always powerful. But whatever we've got going on in our life, if it's quite crucial, we can certainly find an answer. So that's the treasure, what it is you are seeking in life at the moment. Remember impermanence, this is for now, yeah? And it, uh, the symbols might repeat themselves or they might change, yeah? So um, that is what you're looking at and what you're looking for in your own particular experience. And it would be fab if anybody was an example that they'd like to share with me and the rest of the group that we could use to um, unravel what's going on and how to use symbolism. Is there anyone or even a part of it? Not questions and answers as such yet, just sticking to the actual quest experience. Temper. Uh, yeah, we have uh, Victoria who raised her hand. I'm gonna... Um ask Victoria to unmute and then um, Victoria, you can start. Thank you. Oh, lines all over me. Can, I'm just going to move because I've got this uh, distraction going on. <laughs> Maybe if it's that way. It's too much sunshine. I'm not used to it in the north of England. Okay, we'll have to put up with it. You're more important, let's go. Victoria, can I help you? Um, well, I raised my hand um, because I didn't have a clue. So <laughs> hang on, I'm a where, where is Victoria? Oh, there you are. There's another Victoria. Thank you. Okay, oh, I've got, oh, another one I've got too. you, Victoria. Go on then. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was intrepid enough to raise my hand because um, I've always had trouble with, with, um, with like guided visualizing meditations and um, but I sense in you a um, the potential <laughs> to start unpacking things. So I raised my hand just because I'd love to um, I'd love to learn more about how how the, how this works and how to make it effective. 
Okay, so how did you find the experience? Well, I enjoyed it. Um, I, I let myself go into it um, because, because you talked about drawing as, as um, the way of processing it. I didn't draw because I'm very, I'm an art historian, so I'm very self-conscious about things like that. But, but I, I wrote down my experience and um, it was very beautiful. It was like kind of like a children's story storybook. It was kind of it, like the secret garden um yeah, maybe maybe listening to your beautiful um english accent <laughs> it made me <laughs> it made me think of the secret garden and so this very verdant um garden with lots of colors and smell i mean the gu your guidance was very vivid and so it was it came alive much more than any guided meditation i've done before with other teachers so it was it was wonderful but i have no clue what what's behind all of it <laughs> Well, the garden is your safe place. It's your refuge. And, and, and again, it's an aspect of you. Within us all, we have all the refuge we need. Yeah, we just need to awaken it. You know, we, 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 with, uh, we, and I don't know how much of you are involved with Buddhism, but certainly with Buddhist practice, um, we use the idea of refuge so that we feel, so that we develop self-esteem and confidence in ourselves. Yeah. So mm -hmm. your garden can be visualized whenever you're scared. Yeah. Or whenever you're a bit kind of, oh, am I doing the right thing? You know, where, or it, uh, oh, I'm not very good at this. Then the garden, if you just close your eyes and visualize the garden, then you will experience a sense of, no, where I am is just perfect for me yeah yeah and for you it sounded perfect I like the idea of the secret garden because that kind of sums up what you're saying which is that oh I'm not sure I understand any of this well it's still a secret <laughs> it's, it's still a secret for you I mean you know symbolism can be literal and and <laughs> you're not you're an art historian, so you know that the description of art or, you know, matches the painting. And you, you're saying secret garden. I see walls, but there's a gate and it's beautiful and safe within it. But actually, you know, and you can think about this, it's quite private. Hmm. It's quite private, okay? It's very private who you are and what you are. Okay, so that, that's the garden. Anything else you can give me here? Well, I just wanted to say that's so beautiful because um, I'm in a year long um, Buddhist course right now on taking refuge in nature. And ah. we're, we have a cohort every season and um, the summer season just started this morning. So it was, it's perfect. It's a perfect, um, the idea of, of, the, of the refuges in Buddhism and, um, yes. but this garden is, is, yeah, it all fits perfectly. So thank you for that. Okay, well, well, we'll move on maybe to somebody else, but just going back to Buddhist imagery, you know, in Tibetan Buddhism, uh, the, the use of imagery is in Tantra, in Tantric practice, is, is just incredibly vast and extensive. So we, as um, if you are a Tantric practitioner, or even if you are not, you will look at these incredibly intense and complex images of different Buddhas, not just one, you know, you're not just talking Jesus, you know, you're talking the Buddha of compassion, the Buddha of wisdom, there's a wrathful one, there's a peaceful one, there's an active one, there's a, um, a placid one, and then they've got all these other Buddhas going on, and then all this imagery, there's swords, there's cups, there's flowers, there's sacred, all kinds of stuff going on, yeah? And they can be too much for people, but anybody who practices the art of Tibetan Buddhist iconography or really practices um, a deity as their deity, what they're doing is they're not kind of sitting there going, oh, you're so lovely. Oh, you're so powerful. What they're doing is they're actualizing by continually, regularly in their life, visualizing the qualities of that painting. So they become the Buddha, yeah? Mm. They're, they're not doing it as an act of external homage. They're using it 
so that this, by understanding the symbolism, either by painting it or by uh, visualizing it when, when you do your meditation practice of becoming that Buddha with those qualities. And it is the power of the guru that gives you a particular deity or you need compassion or you need wisdom or you, you, you need wrathful energy or you need, uh, and that, that's the spiritual link with the guru. So of course, you know, that many Buddhists, we're so programmed, we end up meeting a guru at the top of the mountain, you know. <laughs> it's very frustrating because you want people to meet somebody <laughs> different. <laughs> we're programmed basically. <laughs> And the gift, you know, it's going to be enlightenment. <laughs> oh, dear. So anyway, yes. So we digress. But just to say, I don't know why. How did I get onto that? Oh, it was through Victoria. Yeah. Just talking <laughs> about talking about how it is used, how we use it. So when you're taking refuge, you know, and, and if you visualize the garden, I mean, you may have a particular spiritual teacher and your spiritual teacher is in the garden, then that don't lose your sense of your own self-esteem. It's really important in Buddhist practice to, to remember that it is your potential, your power that you're actualizing. And all these external aids, the teacher, the artwork are aids. They're aids to your enlightenment. Really important. Thank you. Anybody else with another example now that we got warmed up? Amy. Oh, am I allowed to do that temper? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Amy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to lower my hand here. Um, yeah, I have a couple questions. So when we, um, I was in a Mediterranean kind of setup or scene, and um, on my path, to the left of me, um, you said you said you're seeing something going on. Um, is that supposed to be like an obstacle? Is that um, distraction more than obstacle? Because okay. because you're easily distract. You you know it, it's it's like you know. Do I have a glass of wine or do I meditate? I use the example of glass of wine. You know very specifically because right. what do I you do? I have do I oh I need to relax. Should I have a glass of wine or meditate? <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's it's life's distractions that come our way yeah okay okay I saw um they were a group of, of folks harvesting olives and oh, um nice. yeah they were singing songs and um so I went to go help um because I just felt like I need to help you know so that was yeah. my my distraction um I'm also a gardener so <laughs> kind all of right. all yeah um and of course, my helper was my my guru. Um, but at the top of the very top of the mountain, the gift, um, I couldn't see it. And um, so I just relaxed. I was like, oh, I'm trying too hard to see what this gift is. And um, it was a, like a whirlwind that was like that big he gave me. Like a what? A whirlwind, like a little. A little whirlwind. Sitting yeah, like around yeah. that that's what he gave me was this like wind essentially. Wow. Okay. So I was like, wow, okay. And there's a breeze that came in through me right then through the window. Um and so oh. I was like, oh, it's wind is what he gave me. Um that's so really I, nice. Yeah. But you mean it it's actually you actually felt a breeze. Yeah, I felt a breeze. Which, as I was giving the wind. <laughs> okay. Okay. So it was a pleasant experience to have this little whirlwind. Yeah, I was surprised, you know. Okay. Well, that's pretty. Like I love surprises. Or something. You know what I mean? I was yeah. expecting something like that, right? Something, something physical, but it was, it was not. Um, well, that's when it's really working, when it's not what, because some people go, oh, I got this, but I didn't like that. So I put something else there, <laughs> which is not the point. <laughs> <laughs> so it's great if something comes that is a surprise. Now, if I was to ask you, say all the words that relate to that little whirlwind, 
just speak what would you say um i i guess it's speaking you know giving having voice maybe um that's kind of what i thought um all right so a kind of action yeah yeah an action and does that resonate with you in terms of um you don't say what you think um yeah it does i definitely have like a fear of public speaking and i always have and that's always been the thing that's kind of stopped me like i'm really nervous to even talk right now <laughs> but so, you're doing it it's that whirlwind <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and I love the fact that the breeze came in at the same time. That's really interesting. If we think of the elements, you know, the the elements. Um, I think what you've said is is a very personal description, and you can work with that. So when you do have a fear of public speaking, or perhaps even with saying what you think, with loved ones or people you know. You know, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe there is an element of you that that holds back and and doesn't say anything because of that fear. You visualize that little whirlwind at your heart or in your palms, then it can help you. Mm -hmm. But if we look at the if we look at the the classic symbolism of the elements, then the wind element um, alchemically, if you like transforms jealousy into equanimity yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so it, it's that that wind element and it's green mm -hmm. you know again colors are really important mm -hmm. so you can think of that as well and and its shape is oh is it the semicircle I think it's a semicircle yeah so if we have an element that is apparent in our, like I said, water, you know, was the emotions, it's actually anger into patience, yeah? Um, they, they, they all have two sides to them. Right, yeah? right, yeah. So, and, and as a Buddhist practitioner, then we're being aware of, well, is that going on with me? And is that the emotion I can focus on to transform? Mm -hmm. You know, lo lo lots of our work with emotions, we kind of pick one. There's so many, it would, you know, drown us to think of sorting them all out. But if we get our, our biggest one or the one that's bothering us at the moment, we can work with that, yeah? Mm -hmm. So there's different ways of going at that. Lovely gift. Now your guru at the foot of the hill is remember an aspect of you, okay? Right, uh, yeah. Always got to remember this. Yes, that guru is a real person, but they are at the foot of the hill. Didn't meet you at the top. Who met you at the top? Oh, he did meet me at the top. He met me at the foot and the top. <laughs> oh, he's there at the beginning and the end. <laughs> Yeah. did he walk up with you or did he just fly up there and then you <laughs> let him up no, there? He, he flew up there he didn't walk with me i went by myself yeah. okay okay fantastic thank you very much was that useful <laughs> yes. yes okay thank you. Thank, thank you thank you how are we doing for time we've got a little bit more time i'd like to do a 10 minute meditation at 10 to 8 so temper stop me um utilizing the gift uh, but we've got time for somebody else with something interesting. No. Oh, Victoria. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Hi, Victoria. Yes, can do. Yes. Hi. So uh, I find interesting that um, so when I went in, uh, walking towards the mountain and then this destruction. So I, I climb. Uh, I have the mountain already there and the climb. So <laughs> I think the subconscious is already <laughs> decorating my room almost. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. It's super funny. And then I saw this guy. I got like this person's climbing solo. And they were like just going up the mountain without ropes. They're like, this is the path. And 
okay. thought, okay, so I have to do what they do. And so like, I, I cannot climb, so I'm going to kill myself here. But I thought this is the path. Uh, the, I'm going to the moon directly. I wanted to climb anyway. This is the kind of people that have a level of mind that things seems to be like uh, unlimited or something like that. And then you said, okay, this was a distraction, come back. I was like, okay, I have to leave now, but this was the path. But then <laughs> I kind of, okay, leave it aside. I said, okay, I don't have those powers at the moment. So I just leave. And then I went into the mountain and I found another place and I still climbed the mountain. So I went climbing, but it was like a very easy climb. And yeah, I found interesting that at the end, uh, I met uh, God, like a very caricature of God, <laughs> like yes. almost like with the bird, like with the angel. Like, yeah, brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> exactly. It was like, like the most caricature of God. And then he gave me like a box. And in the box, it was like a staff this, uh, that kings and wizards use. Oh, yes. Like yes. This thing. And then I had that. And then I flew back. And when flying back, I could pass again where the solo climbers were. I could just climb with them because now I had the powers just for fun. So then the mountain was just kind of a, Easy. a hobby or like a passion. Yeah. yeah and then yeah. I, I could go back. So I find it interesting that, yeah, how so, to connect from the beginning. I think. and it was too hard for you 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 couldn't do it you you know so it, it's almost as if you're comparing yourself to others being able yeah. to go on this path maybe this spiritual path or your path right now and and you can't do it but then through accessing your higher self god within yeah this staff and the staff is interesting, isn't it? Because you do see people like Gandalf, wizards with a staff, don't you? Yeah. It's very strong, yeah? yeah. But, it, it's, but it often sort of transforms like a wand into all kinds of magic. So you kind of got, you know, this, this magical spiritual staff and then you can do it. Yeah. So what does that staff represent? If you think of the staff, what words come to mind? in terms of the qualities it's giving you? I think it comes with power and uh, limitless yes. or unconstrained, something like in that sense of potential. Okay, yeah. so, so when you feel again, so much of us suffer from a, a low self-esteem that we just don't think we can do it. And especially, you know, communities are great, but there's a lot of looking around thinking they're better practitioners than me or that person's going to get there before. Oh, oh, oh I never meditate. I never do. Uh, always looking at, at, at what we lack. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if you if, if you visualize your wonderful stereotypical God with giving you that that staff, then you're actualizing your higher self. And that will give you the self-confidence. I can do this. I am mm. one of these climbers. I am on the path. Yeah. It's like an yeah. affirmation that you're using through, through recognizing that that image is important because of what it represents to you. Yeah. Mm. That, that stuff. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's great. I think it's, it's very inspiring to have something like it to, to think, okay, one can also be great in a way. Uh, yes. Like if one is always, uh, or has like, uh, admires very great people, I think they must have something that, yeah. I don't know what they have, but actually must be within everybody or like if one connects with that higher high self. Yeah. Well, totally. Every role model we have is an aspect of ourselves. Because if we recognize and admire those qualities, then we are on a journey to attaining those qualities. Yeah. Mm. That's what you're Thank you doing. very much. Thank you, Victoria. Okay. Time for one more little one. 
if there's anybody else, otherwise we'll do a meditation. I've lost temper, where's he gone? Oh, there you are. <laughs> Shall we do the final meditation? And then if there's anything that occurs right at the end, we, we can um, do that, but we, as nobody else is emerging. I hope there's great clarity with this and you're not totally confused by it. Okay, so in this meditation, we're going to utilize your, your gift yeah, your gift. So we're going to strengthen the idea of your gift and introduce the higher self. So it's in structure, it's very similar to uh, the meditation at the beginning of light and dark, uh, but, but using, using the higher self, the being you met at the top of the hill or the person. And if if it doesn't seem like a higher self because it was perhaps somebody like that little girl's grandma, remember that there are, were qualities in that grandmother that actually was an aspect of that little girl's higher self. You know, if you're meeting like my friend did this, uh, her husband who had died and what she wanted to say goodbye to, you might think, well, that's not her higher self but actually it was fulfilling her need, it was fulfilling a big frustration and overcoming that anxiety about not saying goodbye. So it was a higher aspect of herself. Okay, okay, let's do it. Excuse me. <coughs> So now we're just going to allow all that imagery to fall, like when you throw up one of those uh, snowstorm things and all the snow falls. It's, it's there, but let it rest, giving you some space. As you breathe in and breathe out, find a nice alert posture. and feel fulfilled that you've engaged in an activity that can help you in your life. Understand yourself. Self-knowledge is everything. The person who seeks self-knowledge is truly mature. And that's you here today, seeking self-knowledge. And as you take some deep breaths and gradually settle into regular breathing, let that sense of happiness and fulfillment relax your body. As tensions go, Again, we're abandoning thoughts. As we consciously construct the theater of our minds. We are the directors. And onto that stage, we're going to put that being or person we met at the top of the mountain. And there you are being given the gift.
and then just move off stage with the gift and leave your higher self on the stage. And as you stand in the winds, just consider that their qualities. Say them in your mind, strength, courage. As many as you can think of. And be very aware that they are, they represent your potential self. This is what you admire. This is what you wish to be. And you are on that path to becoming that being. Now you're going to move on to stage with the gift. As that being goes off into the wings and leave the gift center stage. And move back and observe. This is what you need on your path right now. On your path to becoming your actualized potential. This is what you need. What does it represent? In all its full force, say the words. And there's your present day focus. Maybe it represents courage. Or self-esteem. Or to recognize the power within you and nurture that power. And then take it and move off stage, leaving the spaciousness where anything can take place. And how powerful that can be if you can orchestrate it, direct it. Dissolve all imagery into your heart and end the meditation. So just to give you a little bit more depth, you may get emotional as you get in touch with deeper feelings and just remember that this isn't being put into you. I'm providing a, a structure, scaffolding, and you're filling it in. It's coming from you. And you're revealing feelings about whatever is important to express for you now. So don't be afraid of them. Uh, as I said, the garden is your safe place. There may be things in it that make you feel safe in particular that you can visualize. Quite simple things. A pot of lavender, a bay tree, a water feature. 
when you bring them to mind, if you're in a state of confusion or upset, you can act as a calming, um, fortifying object. The state of the road symbolizes how you feel about your path right now. And that's a very nice path to look to always, otherwise. But yours, you might be sitting there thinking, oh my God, my God. It was a nightmare, there were rocks everywhere. So that's just now, yeah? And it, it may be that you feel uh, that it needs moving and that your path, is it the right path? And if there is anybody that's sitting there with anything which is really uncomfortable, I don't know how to do this, but Temple can maybe help me with this. I'm very happy to take an email and help you out. I don't want this to have brought stuff up that you can't deal with. So uh, very happy to do that. Um, the trials and obstacles symbolize things in your life that need to be overcome. They need to be overcome. Um, the visualization may help you see a way to overcome or the problem or may just help you identify what the problem is. And that's, you know, that's the biggest thing. Um, helpers usually help you identify you know, people or attitudes or qualities that can take you forward. So the gurus are wonderful example of that. And another person from Victoria who came up with that. Okay, so just bringing these subconscious thoughts to the surface will help your self-development. You've done it now. You know, there they are. They're in your life and you can think about them. It's fascinating. Um, remember that everything and everyone is an aspect of yourself. Even if they're real people in your lives. I hope that was really helpful and interesting. Nice way to spend a couple of hours. I always love it. I think it's like doing the tarot, you know, the way the symbolism comes comes in. Um, it's very, very interesting. And remember that everything is impermanent. And the next time you do it, which you can do on your own, it may well be very different, yeah? Just let them arise, don't control them. If you do it on your own, the best way I've found to do it is to just play <clears throat> very kind of, you know, like classical, very nice, calming music, maybe like that massage, bloopy music you have, whales, whatever turns you on, but just something in the background, yeah? And then you know the journey, and so you can do it for yourself. That can be very interesting. You don't need a person guiding you through once you've got the trick, and you've got the trick. That's my gift to you. Thank you.